Cheers to Firkin. Oh, sir, Velev, Ermagin, is three slim levas at and made Ibra at a gentagi harrant, a kid shocked a bleem. May I start by thanking very warmly the Society of St. Vincent de Paul for organising today's event held under the auspices of the President of Ireland's Ethics Initiative, and I'm deeply grateful uh, to the willingness expressed by Jeff Maher in his introduction on behalf of all of you to engage with this initiative, which I launched in November of last year, with a view to stimulating discussion across all sectors of Irish society on the challenges of our living together ethically at this beginning of the 21st century. I very much share Jeff's feeling of urgency, the sense that now is the right time to kickstart such a discussion, a time, as he put it, in St. Vincent de Paul's freshly released pre-budget submission, of both risk and opportunity for our country. What is on offer at times, as it were, I think the issues that uh, uh, I have just for a moment lost one of my pages. <laughs> uh, assistant dear. Page two. Now. I hope I haven't disturbed your concentration uh, <laughs> too much by this. I had to pay tribute to your pre-budget submission. The St. Vincent de Paul's pre-budget submission, they have always been among the most detailed, empirically based, and accessible of the submissions that I recall attending over the years in my previous life. And I believe that the organization is well placed to lift the commentaries of our time beyond a description or reiteration of the consequences of poverty on our people. They can lead a discussion, the St. Vincent de Paul can, on the why of it all. The opportunity I believe we must not let go to waste is that of addressing the root causes of the crisis precipitated by the global financial meltdown of 2008 and the model of society that it supported. Indeed, it is not enough to say that the upheavals caused by an unprecedented banking collapse and property bubble can be fixed if the right supervision and regulatory mechanisms are put in place. The current crisis has moral and intellectual ramifications that run much deeper than that. It calls for an interrogation of the values, the vision of life and of human relations that animate us as a society. What is on, I think as well, an amalgamation of highly individualized projects of accumulation, self-centered ideals of consumption, have displaced models of public welfare shared in the public space, enjoyed in the public world. Greed, self-interest, the insatiable pursuit of material gratifications, unrestrained competition, and the placing of the market as the center of public policy for all human needs. Such values have become widely endorsed with sweeping repercussions on policy making, media representations, and more generally, contemporary public discourse on what constitutes prosperity and the good life. What is on offer at times, as it were, is an increasingly private life in a gated community of the mind that serves to protect itself or is at best indifferent to the excluded. The risk, as I see it, is that if we do not tackle the assumptions that have inflicted such deep injuries on our moral imaginations, we will end up going back to business as usual, as many of those advocating a quiescent fortitude on the road to recovery would like us to do. And there are signs already on the housing market, on the credit markets, that such a return to business as usual is underway. I am reminded about the European significance of this myself. The European economic discourse, for example, offers 
a f at best, a, a future of system integration. And what is neglected in that discourse is any concern for social integration. And of course, the history of economic thought can tell us you can get a system integration on a bad model, but with a neglected social integration, you get an enormous democratic deficit. So I think then that we must not miss this opportunity to seek together a new set of principles by which we might live ethically as a society. And of course, this idea was very well encapsulated by St. Vincent de Paul's former vice president, Professor John Monner, when he put it very well, we do not want to look back on this period as one when the seeds of future social inequities were sown, but one in which the value is necessary for a socially just, fair, and caring nation emerged. So I suggest that we must seize the energy of our times, find a moral and intellectual energy as will enable us to address that inability that is so pervasive when it comes to addressing the matters of economy, society, ideology, and the deadening fingers of bureaucracy. In the first phase of my ethics initiative, which was the second of my, the initiative of my presidency, the first being on being young and Irish in Ireland, I invited Irish third-level institutions for this second theme, including the Royal Irish Academy, to contribute. And indeed, universities have, I believe, a crucial role to play in nurturing alternative ways of thinking and in crafting an intellectual response to our current situation. They also have a responsibility. They are gifted with the resources, the time, and the space to discuss these issues. And the positive answer Irish universities gave to that invitation the many ideas that they put forward, and their commitment to organize some 50 events during the course of this year, many of which have already taken place, has been greatly encouraging. Yet I had the impression of a fractured vision of concerned scholars not in contact with each other, of a system under such new utilitarian grip that it yielded in the goal of delivering pluralist teaching of economic theory and history, for example. And then, of course, the reflection on ethics of which I'm speaking, we must never forget, is not just a matter for the academics. It concerns us all. So that is why, in a second phase, I propose that this ethics initiative be brought to civil society organizations as an overall frame as a debate above all, as an opportunity for critical and fresh thinking, which I hope can contribute to harnessing and supporting the profusion of positive initiatives that already exist in society. Last June, Jeff Maha, Tom McSweeney, John Monaghan, John Mark McLafferty and I had a very fruitful conversation in Oris and Uchtron on how the Society of St. Vincent de Paul could contribute to the ethics initiative in collaboration with other organizations who had already expressed an interest in doing so, and some of whom, I'm glad to say, have sent representatives along this morning. As Jeff mentioned, the WHEEL, for example, has initiated a large consultation process entitled People's Conversation, addressing our conceptions of citizenship ahead of the centenary of the 1916 proclamation. DOCUS, the umbrella organization for overseas development agencies has resolved to seize the opportunity for European Year of Development in 2015. And they are going to conduct a reflection on the meaning of development. My office has also had contacts with, among others, the National Women's Council and the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. So may I once again then thank St. Vincent de Paul for providing us with a platform to formally launch this morning the second phase of this national conversation on ethics. I am confident that the debate can and will garner momentum among the wider public for the simple reason that it is a, a reflection many Irish citizens have already undertaken and which I know that they regard as urgent. As members of a society which has been affected more than most by the global financial crisis, Irish people have been led to an abrupt realization 
that the challenge of living together in a way that permits the flourishing of human capability, and as I've already mentioned, a cohesive society, cannot be met, indeed is often contradicted by an uncritical confusion of real needs as a citizen and consumer wants of an insatiable kind, and the reliance on the market to satisfy both. Our citizens are anxious for a vision of where we are heading to as a society. Too many of our citizens live in an atmosphere of unabated stress, dealing with financial circumstances that curtail their horizon and constrict them to a regime that is one simply of survival. If I may quote from St. Vincent de Paul's own publication, here is what one woman has to say about the future. We are educating our children at huge cost, with no hope of a job for them. And another one has these words that are heartbreaking. I've noticed how I think about the future has changed a lot. In the past, I had kind of five or ten year plans. I still have hopes for the future, dreams maybe. There is still a bit of ambition there. But now you just think so much in the short term. You don't have the luxury of planning a future because so much effort is put into just getting by. These voices are telling us something that is urgent we hear. They call upon us to articulate a sense of our long-time perspectives as a society. They may not be the same, but let us debate them. It is a call that invokes the mid-range, the mid-range horizon of emancipatory collective struggles, because there are things that have to be done together. The promises of improvement in terms of the removal of insecurities, of prospects for flourishing that the future must hold for all of our citizens. Irish people are seeking space for a reflection, for an authentic new vision in an impoverished present. Among the important questions and choices which we must urgently address in today's Ireland are how do we view those who are vulnerable? How do we respond to their circumstances? In several of my previous speeches, I suggested that use of the term vulnerable is too often associated with specific categories of people. Vulnerable older people, vulnerable children, for example. The fact is, None of us present here this morning are invulnerable. All of us have urgent needs for care at various stages of our lives, as a consequence of infancy, aging, physical or mental illness, impairment, or other difficulties. Vulnerability is a constituent part of the human condition. All of us will one day face existential circumstances such that we will need support and assistance. And it is how we handle our vulnerabilities, after all, that is the best test of a republic. We should be mindful of using, too, uncritically, and with a suggestion of inevitability, words such as the poor, which have such loaded connotations in the history of our country, and have too often led to harmful distinctions between the deserving and the undeserving poor. Interrogating, then, our attitudes towards poverty at home and abroad is one of the vital questions which I hope the Ethics Initiative will address. And in this regard, the debate already underway within the St. Vincent de Paul Society and beyond on the respective merits of charity on the one hand and the social justice perspective on the other, this debate is a fundamental one. As some advocates view it, Charity does not provide a robust way or sufficient way of responding to the needs for housing, health, childcare, and education of the most vulnerable. Because, after all, it is based on a willingness to give, a willingness which can be taken away, and not on a collectively binding agreement of solidarity, recognizing the rights of those in dignity who receive assistance. So what Ireland needs, those critiques argue, is a full-blown welfare state, real citizens with socioeconomic rights, not just recipients of charity, or as they are often recast nowadays, customers. But yet with a strong argument for tomorrow, today's needs have to be met, 
and I personally do not see the need for making an excluding choice between the two. But it is not for me to settle that discussion. Let me only remark that if tensions exist within the society of St. Vincent de Paul and a debate around these issues, I view them as productive and moral, frictions that keep the important debate going. In fact, it seems to me that St. Vincent de Paul is an organisation that has the ability to traverse all the critical ground between both ends of the spectrum by combining the spirit of charity with the pursuit of social justice. Your mission statement makes clear St. Vincent de Paul is committed to providing support and friendship through the personal bonds of trust and companionship which the members forge with those they visit week after week and through the pragmatic, hands-on responses they apply to people's pressing needs. But you are also committed to working for social justice, as you put it in your own words, to identifying the root causes of poverty and social exclusion in Ireland, and in solidarity with poor and disadvantaged people, to advocate and work for the changes required to create a more just and caring society. In a speech I gave to St. Joseph's Conference in Cavan last year, last February, I said that the unique force of Frederick Osnam's vision is precisely that it combines very practical concerns of how to respond to poverty and exclusion in the here and now, with a long and difficult quest for social justice. Frederick Osnam's words, you must not be content with tiding the poor over the poverty crisis, he wrote. You must study their condition and the injustices which brought about such poverty with the aim of a long-term improvement. So we need both approaches. We need your spirited concern for others, your willingness to offer of your time and support. But we also need advocacy on the public policies for the public world, for institutions and redistribution mechanisms that can reduce inequalities in our society. A thriving charitable sector, of course, does not and should not ever exonerate the state from its duty of care towards all of its citizens. But you know, the ethics of friendship with its moral gift and the building of a caring state, the achievements of concerned citizens, they go hand in hand. So to conclude then, and without preempting the shape and content of your contribution to the Ethics Initiative, nor the manner in which the dialogue you've initiated with other civil society organizations will unfold, may I say that I am convinced that your input will be a most valuable one for your experience is so vast, deep, and it has authenticity. For the insight which all of you, St. Vincent de Paul members and supporters, and you have many supporters, and I'm very happy to be one, yours is a precious contribution. Day after day, you seek out the forgotten. You listen to the voices of the voiceless. You support those who have to cope with unemployment, indebtedness, a relationship breakdown, a disability, a loneliness, and sometimes several of these pl plights all at once because they interact. And your knowledge can ve very productively inform not just our collective discourse, but also the policies aimed at tackling poverty. The experiential knowledge of the citizens whom those policies are serving must be central to their devising in this regard. So I find exemplary the manner in which the research conducted by Vincent de Paul makes such space for the, vo the voices of the people your members support and to whom they offer companionship and friendship and hospitality. This is the case in your recent publication, The Human Face of Austerity, and it is a strong feature of the research you will discuss later this morning, which focuses on the difficulties faced by households headed by a person Parenting alone, for example. So all of us Irish people are grateful for the quiet, sustained weekly work of the St. Vincent de Paul Society volunteers. But we must also be challenged by their actions, rooted as they are in the conviction that the struggles of the marginalised are the struggles of society in general. An adequate collective discourse, then, 
for the island of tomorrow must be one that includes the capacities and goals which in the eyes of our most vulnerable citizens render human life worth living. A discourse that would let the poor and the unemployed of Ireland speak. As the philosopher Theodore Adorno said, the need to let suffering speak is the condition of all truth. And the test of authenticity for our democracy lies in its ability to reconnect with the practices, perceptions, aspirations, and everyday realities of the most vulnerable people among our citizens in a way that enables them to perceive their circumstances in policy options. And this requires very much more than the periodic conducting of polls. Irish citizens have made it clear that they are awaiting a new substantive agenda of ethical options that might compete as policies for our shared future. They are willing with adequate invitation and when presented with challenging alternatives to take part in the crafting of this new agenda. In that journey, a change of consciousness may occur that in turn leads to policy aspirations that are different, that in time becomes the fabric of a real republic. Thus, this initiative is an invitation, an invitation to you volunteers, members and staff of charitable organizations to critically reflect on your own conceptions and practice. It is a call on all the civil society associations represented here this morning, and hopefully more of them will join this platform, to join forces, to voice the values that they wish to see placed at the heart of our collective future. It is an encouragement to you to compel us, those who have been elected, to listen to the voices of the most vulnerable in Irish society. And thus, today's event marks a further step in a process which I am convinced can yield important results. And I very much look forward to the outcome of your efforts. And I assure you of my support in all of your future endeavors. Three slim levas and made the tarjent aki, is glim rahag spana, er gokro the mega shulaki, ni won er marjan, octon tower qui. I so wish you all, I congratulate you on your efforts so far. I thank you for being part of this initiative, and I will look forward very, very much to hearing the result of your proceedings. Thank you very much. Uh, members of St. Vincent de Paul, uh, donors and supporters of the society, uh, representatives of government, uh, agencies and departments. Uh, good morning to you all um, and thank you for being here today. Uh, to see so many here is a huge encouragement to us and to the society um, and to the Society of St. Vincent de Paul uh, Ethics Initiative mm -hmm. event uh, and also later on the launch of our research uh, on lone families uh, which you will hear about from um, John Mark and Liz. Um, as National President, um, I wish to extend uh, a very warm welcome to you, President Higgins, uh, for such an engaging, challenging and timely speech, um, drawing on so much of the day-to-day -day work of the society, the work that we actually do, uh, the ethos of the society, um, and our work in relation to uh, social justice ad advocacy. Um, President Higgins, we are privileged that you have chosen this event um, host, hosted by the Society of Vincent de Paul to bring the ethics initiative to people, to charities, to communities. You embarked upon this initiative earlier this year and are now opening the process wider to civil society um, and uh, organizations like ourselves. We will build on this initiative. Um, we, if you like, uh, confirm to you today that we will support your initiative and indeed, I know that there are many other voluntary organizations that you have alluded to who are already doing work uh, in this area. We are very happy to work with them um, and to support their work uh, and to do our own research as well um, so that we don't end up duplicating effort uh, or time in relation to this work because it is so important in terms of what we actually do. I think you, you've already quoted um, from our, our founder, uh, Frederick Osnum, um, and again, I think it is most appropriate that I use a couple of further quotes 
uh, in relation to him because I suppose when you look at it, uh, these quotes come from the 1830s, 1840s, uh, and so much had changed, um, but yet little has changed in many ways. And just a couple of the quotations. I am asking that we look after people who have too many needs and not, and not enough rights, who demand with reason a, fair, a fuller share in public affairs, security in work, and safeguards against poverty. It's in these people that I can see enough faith and morality to save our society when the so-called pillars of society have failed. Again, a second one. You must not be content with simply tiding the poor over a poverty crisis, but rather you must study their conditions and the injustices which brought about such poverty with the aim of a long-term improvement. Thirdly, charity and justice must go together. And finally, Embracing the whole world in a network of love as being, if you like, another quote uh, from, uh, from, the, from the society. And, and finally, no work of charity is foreign to the society. And I suppose this is, and, and President Higgins has referred to it, this is the hallmark, I think, of the Society of St. Vincent de Paul in Ireland, where our 11,000 members across the country try to live out that mission as best we can in their weekly work by both um, giving where there is need but also trying as best we can to get people back to self-sustainability, whatever that may be for people. So the initiative by President Higgins fits in very much with the ethos of the Vincent de Paul Society, our background um, and what we would like to achieve for the people that we help and support week in, week out. Indeed, in fact, one of the things that we will talk about later on, the wooden parent family research, which we're also launching today, is an example of conversations we have with people and families we visit and assist. Families are the largest group seeking our support, a support provided for 170 years in Ireland by the Society of Vincent de Paul. We have a great number of St. Vincent de Paul members here today, uh, many of whom have travelled long distances to be here, and I thank them for that. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, both the, the past and present members' contribution and the volunteer efforts over the last 170 years. And I express our appreciation, President Ingalls, for your presence here this morning in acknowledging that work um, and in reflecting on it. And indeed, what I want to do now is to present to you um, a book which we have records some of the, um, the work of the society of the last 170 years. Uh, I just want to thank the, all of the people who contributed uh, to the book um, and to the authors, uh, Bill Aller and Joe Dalton, and thanks to everybody who contributed to it. I think it is not a history of the Society of Vincent de Paul. It is something far more important than that. It is, in fact, a, a written from the point of view of the members of the society and gives their experiences in terms of helping uh, those we are privileged to support and help. So it is a great honour for me, President, to present with, to you the first edition. With that, I, I hand you back to, um, to Tom. I, I will speak later on. Um, and again, I would just want to thank everybody for your attendance and for coming. Uh